Um, I try to give uh, a few considerations in the style of uh, the Wissenschaft of the uh, Prussian universities of the 19th century, uh, which attempt not to praise or blame, but to uh, show what's going on uh, with respect to um, the Heidegger controversy uh, with regard to his um, membership in the Nazi party. Um, uh, certainly Heidegger was a very radical thinker. I give uh, evidence of that um, um, by reading a paragraph, a long paragraph from uh, the basic, um, uh, basic Concepts book. The second part of the Anaximander fragment talks about punishment and recompense and recklessness and injustice, thus about juridical and ethical, moral and immoral things according to the contemporary notions. Hence one thinks one thing is clear for today's common sense. Uh, in the fragment, a physical law of the universe is expressed in ethical and juridical notions. And since the entire passage obviously intends to explain reality uh, from the ultimate cause, and since one can also grasp such notions as, uh, quote-unquote, religious, and can call its corresponding assertions, quote-unquote, theological, this passage does not lack a religious and theological moment. Thus, we read in the end of an essay on Annex Mander from the year 1940 the following, uh, quote, from the unity of a great religious, ethical, rational, and physical thought arises the first great philosophical construct of mind, the achievement of uh, Malaysian Annex Mander. Uh, Heidegger goes on to say all of this is um, unhistorical, and none of those categories mentioned, uh, the theological, the moral, uh, the juridical, etc., existed at the time that um, Anaximander was um, propounding his uh, thinking. Um, we, if we start, if we make a juxtaposition between uh, Leo Strauss on the one side and Martin Heidegger on the other, and we begin with... Um, Strauss's um, citizens' understanding, then we can see that the from the citizens' understanding, when we approach such statements as uh, Heidegger made in his um, black notebooks as, uh, quote-unquote, Freud the Jew, um, we can see how the citizen will immediately, uh, um, their dander will be piqued. They'll think um, this must be um, a vicious statement, at least a derogatory statement, at least an indication that Heidegger was uh, hated the Jews, and perhaps that he hated them in the Aristotelian sense of wanting them to um, um, disappear so rapidly that it would be as though they were swallowed up by the earth, um, or um, something worse. Um, now. If we make a distinction, however, as Strauss would make, between um, um, arbitrary um, um, prejudice and um, something beyond prejudice, uh, irrational, um, reasonless um, uh, desire to obliterate from the face of the planet all of one's... Uh, supposed um, enemies. And on the other hand, this uh, question of reason, how so far would Heidegger have reason for um, disagreeing with, say, Freud? Um, and how so far would it be even possible to think the phrase, um, the Jew Freud, as anything other than um, derogatory, um, uh, degrading phrase? Um, so I give one uh, piece of evidence on the side of, um, that Heidegger had some reasons for this um, attitude, and perhaps that even the phrase the Jew Freud is no worse than the phrase um, the German Heidegger. Um, for instance, if we think of Judith Butler and her attitude towards um, uh, German idealism, is it um, a derogatory thing to speak of German idealism? Um, and is there no such thing as um, German thought? Is there no such thing as Russian thought? Is there no, is no groups can be regarded as having, having thought? Um, so from Heidegger's point of view, um, Freud was a personal student of someone called Ernst Haeckel. Ernst Haeckel was um, the chief uh, popularizer of, um, of Darwin, of Darwinism, biological racism in the strict sense. If you look at the um, alternative title on the front piece of Darwin's most favorite 
favored and most famous uh, work, uh, you see the phrase, uh, the favored races, uh, preservation of the favored races. Um, this is uh, part and parcel of what uh, one of Darwin's close, uh, not close relatives, but I, actually one of Darwin's distant relatives, uh, John Galton, who, however, was a reader of uh, Darwin and learned from Darwin and produced the um, first steps of um, um, a, a theory of general intelligence linked to a eugenics program, a eugenics program which, of course, was bigger in the United States um, than it ever was in, um, um, not than it ever was, let's say, that's obviously false, but then it was um, at the time of the rise of um, Nazism, where Nazism was um, very well informed from the, the view of the biological view of race and intelligence um, has, um, we can supremely represent through John Galton and his relative uh, Darwin. Um, Heidegger was actually um, totally repelled by the idea of biological race and um, denounced it in every way. So you can see that if um, we're dealing with people that um, subscribe to this view, Heidegger would probably be against that. If it were actually true that we could speak of um, um, a Jewish thinking, which would then uh, bring us into the question of whether Spinoza was the first um, step into this um, kind of thinking and other such questions, then we could say, does Heidegger have a reason for um, saying what he says? I'll, I'll point out that in the contemporary university, it's very usual to find um, uh, titles of uh, symposiums and lecture series that have some, that run something along the lines of um, uh, Jewish thinking from Spinoza to um, Wendy Brown or whoever it may be, um, uh, and including thinkers such as um, Rosenzweig and um, um, the Rabbi Abraham Heschel and putting them together in one group. And um, so is that racist to say that there's a Jewish thinking? Is it racist to say that there's a German thinking? Um, to some extent, one wants to go over to in the current period, the, the current citizen's understanding is very ready to um, become almost hysterical and um, show the, the primary uh, instability of the human being and immediately um, say that we're, we cannot even speak of groups. We can't speak of groups, especially in any connection with um, DNA, genetics, biology, to such an extent that I noticed um, recently there's among, uh, for instance, libertarian-minded um, conservatives, there's a tendency to recapitulate the Lysenkoism of the, um, uh, the Soviet um, era because um, Lysenko was essentially denying genetics and therefore denying that there could be any um, biological basis for um, selecting uh, group phylogenetics or um, family trees in a group biologically linked and then linked to John Galton style um, general intelligence. All of these are things which anyone who knows Heidegger, and, and if you consider what I just read about Heidegger's uh, going back behind all, regarding all these things as uh, ahistorical, as trying to go back behind the whole history of what he understands as Western history um, with various complications, um, it, it becomes not very cogent to regard Heidegger as being um, a quote-unquote anti-Semite. Um, so Leo Strauss proscribed that term um, for reasons which are actually fairly obvious if we think about them, but they're not obvious if we um, take them from our citizens' understanding. The citizens' understanding, the political understanding, immediately um, dis as, a, as a strong... Um, reaction against any uh, talk of um, negative terms applied to a group. Um, the point of the older understanding, the uh, Wissenschaft understanding, uh, the understanding that somebody like Hannah Arendt, somebody like uh, Leo Strauss, somebody like Martin Heidegger um, understood is that they make a distinction between as an individual um, I may dislike Italians, for instance. Maybe I despise Italians because Italians have certain traits that I don't like. They have the kind of gangsterism. Um, 
uh, Italians are horrible people. I may personally dislike Italians, but they make a distinction between whether I take the attitude ideologically that we should um, exterminate Italians. Um, that's a very great difference. Um, uh, someone may personally, even without having any um, reasons behind it, simply spontaneously dislike some uh, ethnic group. They don't like the smell of that group. Um, they don't like the, uh, the shape of the noses of that group. Whatever it is, that's a personal instinctual um, inclination. And it's quite different from coming out with an ideolo ideology, which is to say with um, uh, searching for facts, um, so-called facts, scientific, empirically tested and repeatable um, situations where we can show um, that this group is undesirable and um, even if we personally like them, we should nonetheless, for rational reasons, um, uh, exterminate them. This kind of uh, separation is impossible when you, ha when you talk all the times in terms of anti-Semitism rather than what Leo Strauss um, recommend it, which is we should say, is it that Heidegger had a vicious hate of Jews and wanted them to be um, obliterated from the face of the planet, exterminated? Or is it that he had certain reasons for disliking um, thought which may um, reasonably said to be held by a group of people? Um, so why would that be so in the... Um, so I give the evidence of Leo Strauss, who I think it's very reasonable to take his view. He was the reasonable man. Um, he wasn't uh, taken away on, uh, by, um, um, uh, let's say, squeamishness. Um, and uh, moreover, he moved in the same spheres, in the same um, cultural world um, as Heidegger by only a 10 year uh, difference. He was, grew up um, among very religious people, uh, as Heidegger grew up among very religious people. Um, in Heidegger's case, Catholics, in um, uh, Strauss's case, uh, uh, Orthodox Jews. Um, both of them uh, came over to the view that the unaided human reason, the philosophical reason, has to come first. In um, Strauss's view, this would be the Athens over Jerusalem. Um, and what Strauss says is if we want to know why Heidegger um, had his uh, foray with Nazism, why he joined the Nazi party, why he tried to uh, this is what wouldn't be granted by the current common sense, I believe, on first blush reading of the bl uh, Black Notebooks, uh, would be that um, this was an attempt at an intervention. Why was it an attempt at an intervention? Leo Strauss points us to um, Heidegger's lectures on the Sophist, where he ded makes a dedication to uh, Natrop, um, Paul Natrop, the um, Platonist, and in that uh, dedication, he says, Natrop had the sense of the genuine spirit of the uh, German youth, and that spirit tended towards the um, wish to realize a genuine um, inner responsibility, um, which I believe conforms to the first lines of that, those black notebooks where Heidegger speaks of his questions, who are we, um, who are we, and um, uh, who are we, meaning um, uh, what are we about? What is our purpose for existing? What is our um, Schwerpunkt? What is the gravity of our um, of us as a group? And who and and then the second, who are we? Um, who who is the the circle of our group? What does it uh, encompass? Um, and uh, and other questions which are a modification of the Kantian uh, primary questions about what the human being is and um, what it ought to expect, what we ought to expect as human beings, what we can know, and so on. Um, uh, in this dedication, Heidegger mentions a meeting that happened in uh, 1913, uh, which was a peace meeting, um, which was called the um, uh, something like the Ersten uh, Deutscher, uh, Ersten Frei Deutscher um, uh, Jugendtag. Um, at Hoyer uh, Meisner, which is a location in uh, the far uh, north, north, um, northeast of Germany, which was a meeting to protest uh, um, uh, the militancy, the um, saber rattling, which was happening uh, and which did lead to World War One. Um, this was um, Heidegger um, saying that the genuine German spirit is about the youth um, being for peace 
and uh, I mean, this is what you derive from reading, just from reading what this dedication in um, the the sophist um, in his uh, text where he's teaching sophist and um, those that lecture series, which is uh, made in the twenties, and um, um, and you can see it all throughout Heidegger. That 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 uh, just to look at the picture of him, I would say. Um, Maybe this veers towards emotionalism, but I'll give it um, as a, just as a piece of evidence, which could be judged one way or another. It's not uh, dispositive in itself, but I, I mean, if, even if you just look at the early photographs of Heidegger, at, uh, his fellow feeling is um, there's a photo of him as an um, adolescent um, uh, caring for um, uh, one of his fellow youths, putting his arm around him, a, a sickly looking youth. Um, if you look at pictures of Heidegger, he's um, almost always has a smile on his face. Uh, this is not a, um, a warmongering man uh, from the evidence. Um, those evidences could be possibly um, uh, someone that has those traits could possibly uh, be in favor of Hitler or um, exterminating um, uh, Jews and gypsies or all those things. That's possible. But we have to um, regard the whole, um, all the evidence on the whole, including uh, Leo Strauss's view, which I think is um, uh, a very um, reliable view on the whole for um, the reasons I've just given. Um, um, just to add one further thing, I'd say, from the point of view of a citizen's understanding, we're moving in this space, which, uh, to go back to what I was saying in the earlier um, recording, we're moving in this space where um, there are certain things that uh, we start from, which we've been cast into, as it were. Um, uh, how is that? The, the Vorhofen height? How is the, um, the thrownness? Or the, the thrownness could also be called a cast, being cast, being cast into the uh, world under this um, citizen's understanding, which we would then have to modify in some way through um, what we learn as we go along. Um, I think of um, this example from anthropology where in the 90s or so somebody went into a Japanese department store and they discovered uh, Santa Claus being um, crucified uh, in a um, department store display. And um, it's clear that such a display uh, from the citizens' understanding of uh, the ordinary Jap Japanese, um, uh, had absolutely nothing uh, of the flavor of, uh, say, uh, David, uh, how do you say his name, Wanakovich, Wana the uh, artist who was famous for the Arthur Rimbaud um, mask series, the photographs with Arthur Rimbaud mask in New York, who did um, some kind of uh, religious piece of art with a cross where the um, um, American um, uh, Christians came out and, and, and um, boycotted it, boycotted the fact that it was in a museum. And there was obviously an intent to um, attack Christianity as um, in, I think, in uh, Wona Konnich's case, because it was um, anti-gay and had led to the, um, uh, the state being against uh, um, homosexuals in an overt way, according, according to the way he saw it. But... Um, you can see how that is um, a citizen's understanding, which is responding to something. Whereas in the Japanese case, um, the passion of Santa Claus, as it were, um, Santa Claus on the cross, suffering on the cross, is absolutely not um, a response to Christianity in any sense. It's simply an, a total um, obliviousness to uh, what Christianity is all about or... Um, its moral um, weight. So in the same way, from our um, Schwerpunkt, as Schiller put it, from the center of our citizens' understanding of what the world's all about, when we um, make this historical look at um, phrases in the black notebooks, we're um, incapable of, uh, we're not looking at it from uh, the Schwerpunkt where Leo Strauss grew up, where Heidegger grew up. Um, we can only do that in an artificial way by using our reason and by um, thinking about what reasons we'd have to think about that in a different light.